Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is April 20th. Today we celebrate the botanist who named the fuchsia plant, and we'll also learn about the first American to become a full-time naturalist. We'll hear some charming thoughts on April and May from a Scottish author who mentored Lewis Carroll. And we grow that garden library with a 25-year-old garden classic that was written to help gardeners in the Big Apple, New York City. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of the Daffodil King, Peter Barr. We celebrate his 195th birthday today. But first, here's today's curated news. Today's curated news comes to us from the garden blogger Philip Oliver, who gardens in the Pacific Northwest in his garden in Vancouver, Washington. Philip's post was a celebration of Garden Bloggers Bloom Day. Philip writes, What a way to begin the month with vivid violet blue blooms of rhododendron blue barren. The plant itself is a bit scraggly, but the blooms are a showstopper. And then another rhododendron that Philip loves is the rhododendron taurus. It's a beautiful red rhododendron. In this post, Philip shares all of the beautiful ornamentals that are blooming in his garden right now this month. Everything from the beautiful Clematis armandii to a pretty pink camellia called Donation. And then Philip wraps things up by sharing a handful of pictures of his blooming tulips. The stunning bleeding heart, known as gold heart, with extraordinary yellow foliage, as well as a great shot of the serviceberry autumn brilliance. Now, if you would like to be inspired by all of Philip's wonderful photos from his garden for the Garden Bloggers Bloom Day for April, all you need to do is the next time you're in the Facebook group for the show, search for the word bloom and Philip's post will pop right up. And if you're not in the group, don't worry about it. You can always join the next time you're on Facebook. Just hop on up to the search bar and type in the words Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. And before I forget, I want to welcome our newest members, Taylor McLean, Ella Wolf, Nancy Sherman, Denise Atwood, Nature Farmer, Janine Diana, Alina Alvarez, Laura Van Thunen Greeno, Anau Chow Han, Cindy Bird, Deanna Morton, Yelda Class, Mark Malter, Joy Norgard, Janie Langley, and Haley Giambalvo. Welcome to all of you. It's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for today. April 20th. Today is the birthday of the French priest and botanist Charles Plumier, who was born in Marseille on this day, April 20th, in 1646. Regarded as one of the most important botanical explorers of his time, Charles served as a botanist to King Louis XIV of France, and he traveled many times to the New World, documenting plants and animal species. During his third expedition to the Greater Antilles, Charles discovered the Fuchsia trophylla on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, which is modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Charles named the fuchsia plant after the 16th century German botanist Leonard Fuchs. And because he named the fuchsia, Charles is sometimes referred to as the father of the fuchsia. 
Now, the fuchsia has colorful upside-down blossoms that hang from the stems. This is how fuchsias get the common name ladies' eardrops. And that drooping habit is reflected in the Irish name for fuchsia, day or a day, which translates to God's tears. And it's worth noting that the fruit of all the species of fuchsia is edible. Although many fuchsia fruits are bland and have a bad aftertaste, but the fuchsia variety Splendens has a flavorful fruit and can be used to make jam. Now, in addition to the fuchsia, Charles discovered and named both the begonia and the magnolia. Charles named the begonia after Michael Begon, who was the governor of the French Antilles for three years from 1682 to 1685. In fact, it was Begon who recommended Charles for the position of plant collector in the Caribbean for King Louis XIV. So that naming of the begonia was a little payback by Charles to Michael Begon. On the other hand, the naming of the magnolia was in recognition of the great botanist Pierre Magnol, who introduced the concept of plant families. Now, the plant names Fuchsia, Begonia, and Magnolia first debuted in Charles Plumier's 1703 book called New Plants of the Americas. Charles drew the plants and animals that he discovered, and his drawings were actually quite good. In fact, Charles Plumier's illustrations of fish were featured in a 2018 book by Professor Todd Peach. It was called Charles Plumier and His Drawings of French Caribbean Fishes. And Carl Linnaeus and his wife were huge Plumier fans. They used Charles's artwork to make wallpaper for their home. Today, Charles is remembered by the genus Plumeria, a tropical. Plumeria grows in shrubs and trees. Plumeria is sometimes called by the common name Frangipani. This is because an Italian marquee named Frangipani used Plumeria blossoms to create a perfume that was used to scent gloves during the 16th century. And today is the birthday of the American botanist, artist, and naturalist known as the flower hunter, William Bartram, who was born on this day, April 20th in 1739. The son of the Quaker botanist John Bartram, William, or Billy as he was known to his family, was the first American to pursue a life devoted to the study of nature. Together, William and his father were the leading American plant collectors and horticulturists of their time. The two explored colonial Pennsylvania and New York. In his heart, William was an artist, and his nature art was widely acclaimed. But before William's notoriety for his art was established, his father John worried that Billy would end up a starving artist, and he attempted many times to steer his son toward other more lucrative endeavors. Ultimately, William's father came around, and he and William went on their final adventure together in Florida. While John collected specimens, William sketched and wrote. During this trip, John and William came upon a unique tree, a tree that John named the Franklin Tree, after his dear friend Benjamin Franklin. The botanical name for this tree is the Franklinia alatamaha. 
Later in his life, William would return to the spot where he and his father had discovered the Franklin tree, and he collected seeds for propagation. And thank goodness he did, because by 1803, the Franklin tree had gone extinct in the wild. And so all the Franklin trees that are cultivated and prized in gardens and arboretums around the world today are descended from the seeds that William Bartram collected. William was also the very first person to describe and name the oak leaf hydrangea or the hydrangea corsifolia. After this trip, William returned to Florida to farm. It was another career move that worried his dad. In 1791, his book about his 2,400-mile exploration of the American South, called Travels, was published. The book became an immediate sensation in Europe, where people were curious about the flora and fauna of the New World. In B.J. Healy's book, The Plant Hunters, there's a charming summation of William's story. It goes like this. Throughout his book, Travels, a book that achieved worldwide recognition and profoundly influenced Wordsworth, Coleridge, and many later writers, William more than proved himself a worthy son of the old Quaker pioneer. John Bartram need not have been troubled in his later years. He would have been proud of Billy in the end. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words are from the Scottish author and mentor to Lewis Carroll, George MacDonald. This is from his book, Sir Gibby. May had now set in. But up here among the hills, she was May by courtesy only. Or if she was May, she would never be might. She was indeed only April, with her showers and sunshine, her tearful childish laughter, and again the frown, and the despair irremediable. Nay, as if she still kept up a secret correspondence with her cousin March, banished for his rudeness, she would not very seldom shake from her skirts a snowstorm and oftener the dancing hail. Then out would come the sun behind her and laugh and say, I could not help that, but I am here all the same coming to you as fast as I can. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Ken Drews's New York City Gardener by Ken Drews. This book came out in 1996, and the subtitle is a how-to and source book for gardening in the Big Apple. In this book, one of America's top horticulturists, Ken Drews, shares his top tips for New York City's urban gardeners, as well as his favorite haunts for resources. Now, when he wrote this book, Ken gardened in a tiny, shady, 21 by 50 foot space behind his Brooklyn townhouse. When this book came out, Ken had just bought a two and a half acre plot of land on an island in the middle of a small New Jersey river. And although some things have changed over the years, Much of what Ken shares in this 25-year-old how-to garden classic remains relevant. This book is 221 pages of gardening goodness in the Big Apple with timeless inspiration for urban or small space gardeners. 
You can get a copy of Ken Drews's New York City Gardener by Ken Drews and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $5. But I just want to caution you, if you're interested in getting this book, act quickly, because the paperback copies that are available for $5, well, there's only a handful of those. And as of right now, when this post is getting published, hardcover copies of this out-of-print book start at around $700. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today's the birthday of the Scottish nurseryman and merchant Peter Barr, who was born on this day, April 20th in 1826. After learning that work remained incomplete for cataloging Daffy Down Dillies, as they were called at the time, or daffodils as we now know them, Peter became inspired to collect, breed, and study them. Today, Peter is credited as the man who popularized the daffodil. In America, Peter's promotion of daffodils inspired a bit of a daffodil craze after the Civil War ended. Over his lifetime, Peter bred over two million daffodils at his Surrey nursery in England, and that earned him the moniker the Daffodil King. And at one point, the Peter Barr Daffodil, a white trumpet variety, commanded $250 per bulb. And as you can imagine, each spring, people would travel from all around to see thousands of daffodils, representing over a hundred unique daffodil species blooming at Peter's Nursery. When Peter was in his 70s, he traveled the world, collecting daffodils in Asia and South America. When Peter finally retired, he went home to Scotland, and once there, he pivoted and began cultivating primroses. Two years before his death, Peter famously mused, I wonder who will plant my grave with primroses. When Peter died, his obituary hailed that Peter was known from, quote, one end of Great Britain to the other. Today, the Peter Barr Memorial Cup is awarded by the Royal Horticultural Society for Excellence in Daffodils. And in 2019, there was a grand blue plaque unveiling at the site of Peter's English Nursery along Garrett Lane. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove and Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.